Greetings, Dragon Ball Infinity. Lai Psycho here with your roleplay review for the 24th of July, 2016. Earth. The Coxis Plague. Incubation. Well, this is the log I should have done last time, but I missed it. Regardless, this is the log where Sarah Trindle dies. Anyway, a thousand is dealing with the arriving back at his ship to discover that Gilder has vanished because, you know, he escaped. Sarah shows up, tries to help, gets infected by, you know, everything in the area. Samuel gets infected a little bit too, but his immune system's a bit stronger. You know, bio-droid and whatnot. Bio-android, biological android. Anyway, so the log breaks off because Thousand goes off to find Gilder. Which isn't hard to find, because Gilder rushes back to attack with bombs for some reason, trying to take out the ship. Gilder himself is infected with the virus. He knows something's wrong with him, something's influencing him, but apparently he can't control it entirely, so he goes off attacking Thousand. The log breaks up, Thousand uh, basically goes off to try to recapture the infected human. And that doesn't go great. Gilder fights back. And given his rhetoric, oh, he is lucky as hell that that was thousands, not Jules. Because after the, who knows, maybe I'll go spread the virus some more. Jules would have been like, done with this. Nuke the forest. And everywhere around Gilder. Just kill him dead. Eradicate the virus in whole. Reading that, it's probably a good thing that Jules isn't aware of the specific intricacies, because with Thousand trying to talk him currently into what he is, like, Jules would be having none of that. Regardless of the doctoral character who actually deals with viruses, Samuel himself gets stuck watching Sarah become overtaken by the infection, and, ugh, poor guy. I don't often feel bad for Samuel because, you know, I have biases against the player character, but that was very well roleplayed, Sam. Very well roleplayed, because you can see Samuel was like, what the fuck? I just want to help! I just want to help, but I keep killing shit! Anyway, that was a good roleplay overall. It ends with Sarah dead, and Gilder... And Gilder... Gilder ends up, uh... Recaptured after, you know, Samuel shows up on scene, because... Kind of heartbroken over the whole... Sarah thing. It's not entirely his fault, he was just trying to help in the virus, but he kind of blames Gilder. Anyway, it was a good roleplay, kind of... Oh, it's kind of sad overall. Regardless, good job with everyone who survived. Sorry, Sarah Trindle, we will miss you and your character. It's unfortunate. I don't even like her. I, 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 she causes she caused more trouble in the RP, but still, that was that was a decently depressing log. Nice use of the pathos, gentlemen. Major corruption. This log follows Sergeant Major Slaughter and his crew on board the Dauntless, one of the Alliance's more hardy ships, on their trip to Arlia you know, to verify for the Alliance whether or not it actually appeared or not, and to gather intel on the situation. The mission is a success. And I say that because the information will be able to reach the Alliance. However, it does not go well. Slaughter, his medic, and another big dude deploy down to the surface. They get a horde rush. Slaughter gets his people back to the ship orders the Dauntless to flee, and he's unfortunately, while he's trying to flee as well, he's about to get on board. He gets ripped back down to Arlia by a clawed hand of a woman who's very not good. Not good at all. No, not good for the Alliance either. Anyway, Slaughter fights her, and you know, Slaughter is a pretty OP character. Like, he's basically a raid boss set at tier 5, and he does pretty well. He would have broke her. Maybe. Doubtful. I have a feeling this is one of those characters who we're going to find out later is completely overpowered, especially if they overpowered Slaughter. Even worse than that, she corrupts Slaughter and makes him her slave. 
Oh, that sucks for the Alliance. That sucks very badly for the Alliance. Given that their basic BFG has just been not only taken away from them, but turned against them. So, shit. That's, that's gonna suck for player characters later. Also, this was an entirely NPC log. Credit goes out to Kuro Gain, my fellow role-playing and men. Good job, mate. To Epitome. This log follows Prometheus after, uh... He rebuilds Virgil a body. Prometheus being Dumbaston's Chaos clone. Anyway, Prometheus is like, Hey, Virgil, I have a job for you. And Virgil's like, Hey! Eh. What is it? I kind of own you. You just built me a new body. It's like in real flesh, but I'm not really going in cog, so whatever. And then Prometheus is like, I need you to get me a freshly created demon from the epitome of darkness or despair or whatever the hell we call it. Anyway, uh, Dumbaston or Prometheus, the chaos clone, explains that uh, demons are born through nexus points of like pure evil. In the epitome. So, he wants Virgil to get him a fresh one for experimentation purposes. Ah, uh, always love experimentation. Anyway, Virgil obviously has very little choice, but he's been given res resources to complete his task. And it might not be easy, because he's going to the epitome. I mean, spawning rates are probably going to be a bit higher after he gets there, you know. At the end of the Null log, or the end of the Void log, resulted with the epitome being shaken violently, and it resulted in a lot of insta-kills for the demon population, and, well, they don't really die so much as, uh, when they die there, they just respawn. So, I mean, it shouldn't be too difficult to actually get his hands on one, but, uh, well, it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, if any of my fellow roleplay men sees this log while it's happening, feel free to throw a wrench into the works. Anyway, good log. The Grudge. This log takes place before Dumbaston is taken to the epitome. He's apparently on Vegeta for some reason or another. Something about cosmic ley lines and forces of the universe and whatnot. Ugh, giving Dumbaston cosmic magic might not have been the best idea on my part. Regardless, he's basically scouring Vegeta for this particular ley line, and he comes across what used to be the Hall of Kings. Of course, it's not really a hall so much anymore as, you know, desolate wasteland, but, you know. He pieces together where it is, and then he finds out that the souls of previous royal families have left an impression on the cosmic ley lines, and deduces that there must have been some ritualistic ceremony and whatnot, and there's still a soul that's wandering through it. He guesses as, as the as the identity of the uh, wanderer who's like walking the halls and whatnot. Not going to lie, I have no idea what the point of this log was, but it has something to do with cosmic white lines and there was mentioned that there might be another one on Hidia. So that's fun. Anyway, it's not a bad read, although it does leave one curious. Why was Dumbaston looking these things out, or seeking these things out, and what does he plan on doing with them? Regardless, he goes to fix, or seal, or do something with the ley line, and it attracts the attention of the Watchers that are, you know, not really there. They're just dead imprints of souls that were left behind. They don't seem happy, and they impart upon him a great deal of anger and rage. Anyway, he takes it with him and leaves. Not going to lie, Dumston, I have no idea what you're doing here, but, uh, well, if circumstances hadn't shifted so drastically, I'm sure I'd find out. Anyway, interesting read. Good log. Epitome, Arrival, Part 2, The Worst Day. This log follows Sam and Dumbaston's arrival on the epitome, or in the epitome, with Sadia. It starts off with a psionic projection from Haggis, updating them on, uh, you know, what just happened with the Null and Void. 
Anyway, Sebia has a mixed reaction because he has a little bit n more idea of what actually got went on, i.e. he's a champion of order, so he knows that both he or both Aiden and Aiden were fighting against Tagus in the Null, and he knew what Tagus had done, so he gives Tagus a clap and you know, given the circumstances, it seems un insensitive, but, you know, ballsy move. Regardless, Haggis updates Samuel and Dumbaston on his current predicament and basically says goodbye, gives him a heads up on what Recurius is carrying, you know, six of the seven Dragon Balls. Six of the seven Nightmare Dragon Balls. Damn. Mm. One more to go. Anyway, after Haggis's portion and his farewells are complete, they move along to the city of Abba, what, what, whatever that city name is. The largest city in the Epitome, housing billions. It was, anyway, until the entire planet started shaking. Like, it, it's still shaking, even after the end of the... Aiden having his connecting quartz truck is not good for the universe. Shakes things a little bit. Shakes things right up! Anyway, so it slightly makes their job easier as it kills a bunch of the chaff. And they get to the city. Sabia basically throws up his power, throws up his order power, and acts as a beacon, pulling basically all the real defenses the city would have left way away from Dumbaston and Samuel. Anyway, he goes off to fight, and then Samuel and Dumbaston goes to try to retrieve the corpse of Aiden. Adun, whatever the, his name is. Anyway, it goes... Mm, it doesn't go well. Adun has to come back to his corpse to stop the universe from shaking, so... He was gonna show up anyway, but, you know... The defenses on the mausoleum that his body was in had specific non-demon and order defenses, so Dumbaston was cool! Samuel kept getting attacked for some reason. Sam tries to transform himself into demon, see if he can mimic some of that demony goodness. It, it doesn't work. He gets covered in water and electrocuted at one point, and but but Demiston does well to help out his buddy. They get to the corpse. Aiden sh is already there, and a fight breaks out. Of course, Aiden is secretly suicidal. He hates he had hated being the god of fucking chaos. And, you know, he was just waiting for his brother to realize that he had broken the system, like when he usurped the title of Order God, instead of, you know, just there just being a god of balance or something. Anyway, the only problem is there's a thorned demon dumbest in at this time, and, uh... Well, he kind of mocks Aiden, and Aiden's like, you know what? Fuck it, you're right. Here. Have ten million souls right into your mouth since you like to absorb them. And then he, like, keeps the thing together. Samuel, at this point, is dealing with a clone of himself. It's not as powerful as the clones that were made from Arlia. Different spell. Considerably less powerful. Or at least in terms of, you know, the plus two tiers that the original Chaos clones had. This one was just straight tier on tier. Samuel managed to fight him off, but by that time... Dumbaston had had 10 million souls shoved down his throat, and, uh, you know, given the thorned form's ability to absorb souls, and, uh... Well, before Dumbaston becomes completely batshit evil, he manages to cast a fucking emergency spell and send Samuel way away to a place that he perceives as, at the very least, safer than where they're at now. Anyway... Dumbaston is no longer a good guy after this one. The the demon form is pretty much completely taken over. Like, Adun could have given him more specific orders if he really wanted to, but that's that's not really how he operates. That's more that's more order stuff, you know? Using champions as pawns and giving them orders and stuff. So he's like, have at the universe, sir. And then he turns Thorned Dumbaston loose. So yeah, Sam Sam feels like he's a complete failure. That's, that's just not a good day for anyone who's an ally of Dumbaston because he basically became exactly what they all feared after Zeon. Whoops. Or at least we'll see how it develops. Anyway, good log. Oh, yeah, um, note, Sabi is dead. 
Like I, we didn't. I didn't really write out the fight and stuff, but to buy time and to go against the like demon warlord who was in charge of the city, he had to go all out. He won, but he's dead. He he had to win using his like final order trump, which gives him a plus two to your power up. But you know, after ten rounds. So, that pretty much kills off all of the NPC Champions of Orders I've had. The only Champions of Orders left are Stoate, PC, and Kenoya. And neither of them have been active in roleplay lately, so, uh, Aiden's Pawns of Order are kind of, uh, non-existent at the moment. Or Aiden's Pawns of Order, not Aiden's, whatever. You know which one I mean. Anyway, like I said, good log. The Thorned Pact. This log follows up on the epitome after Dummiston's been, you know, taken over by the Thorned. And the Thorned's like, hmm, I could entirely kill the Namekian now, but I kind of need some of what he has because he can't access all the important shit, you know, like how to do magic. Of course, Thorne's a dick. And he thinks he has the advantage, but Dummiston is a clever bastard. So, it's, it's not a great deal. The Thorn's still pretty much in control, but he pretty much works out a deal that the Sanctum is a Sanctum, and it's also a Sanctuary, and so long as the Thorn doesn't, you know, kill all of his allies there, he'll be willing to share some of what he knows. I say some of because I'm pretty sure Dumston didn't share his exact memories, like all of his personal memories. He shared his ability to do magic, which doesn't bode well for the rest of us. The Thorned with magic is not a great thing at all, because he's basically still powered to his normal tier, but he also has magic, i.e. it negates the natural debuff of the magic, which turns the Thorned Demon into a fucking raid boss. A very potent raid boss. Luckily, there are other mages in the cosmos, and magic can be dealt with. Hopefully. Anyway, this was a good log. Uh, Dummiston's basically imprisoned. This is an analog to Dummiston first making a pact with the Thorned Demon so he could access that power and, you know, unleash it when necessary. The Thorn's a little bit overconfident. Uh, no, he's not. I gave that motherfucker 10 million souls. He's not overconfident at all. He's, he's, he's rightly arrogant because of the amount of raw power he has coursing through him. I mean, we're talking about the same type of fucking magic and fuel that was used to copy every PC and basically every NPC above Tier 0 on Arlia and make a Chaos clone of them. So... Soul magic is pretty powerful, and now the Thorn has access to that, because, you know, he has souls to burn through. <laughs> Lots of souls to burn through. Uh, on the plus side, Dummiston's there still trying to not get his teammates killed, so, I mean, at least there's that. Good log. This, this will help out his teammates when they encounter him, because Samuel, Samuel knows what's up. And we'll get to that in a moment. Good luck! Picking up the pieces. This log follows Sam after his events in the epitome. You know, Thorned Dummiston's cognitive last act is Dummiston sending him someplace safe. Here we learn that Prometheus and Dummiston are working coherently in order to try to fix the universe. Dummiston's kind of a special case. He's working with his Chaos clone because his alignment is far closer to neutral than everybody else's. He's mostly a good guy, but yeah, he's willing to go a little chaotic. And since the spectrum is order and chaos, and Dummiston is pretty much... He's good with the order, he's good with the chaos. When Prometheus was made, he's good with the chaos, good with the order. And given their natures, as far as the end version of what they are, as they started to shift, when Dummiston went full-on thorned and started going more and more chaos-prone, or evil-prone, his chaos clone pretty much started inverted, or inverting. So, the chaos clone of Dummiston has basically shifted his, shifted his alignment, because, you know, the original shifted so drastically. Anyway, to add legitimacy to Prometheus's claim, Prime is 
brought into the log, and there were contingencies that Dummiston had in place just in case this Thorn fucker got out of hand. Damn Thorn Dummiston. Anyway, Prometheus updates Samuel on the situation and the fact that they're going to need to gather their forces because Prometheus is a tier 6. And he had problems just matching the Thorn form before the bastard was empowered with 10 million souls. So yeah, they're, they're going to need some help. They uh, talk about finding some way to contact Aiden, the, the Order Avatar of the Cosmos. Because, you know, that kind of power will be useful in such things. And then Prometheus hooks Samuel up with a really fast ship so he can go both find Requius, who Aiden, Aidun told Thorned Dumbaston to go find, you know, because the six of the seven Nightmare Dragon Balls. And Samuel gets sent on his way to find Requius and warn his friends of the danger that is to come from the captain. So, while well, at least the Thorned Dumbaston, or, yeah, while Thorned Demon Guy is making a mental deal with Dumbaston in order to access some of his magical power, the contingencies are already rolling out in order to stop him. Of course, there's no guarantee they can. Ten million souls. I, I mean... Like, like I said previously, the earliest spell that copy and pasted everyone and added plus two tiers to them was basically soul, demon soul magic, and, uh, not, not, uh, a thorned, thorned raid boss is what we should call him. Not even thorned dumbstone. Thorned raid boss. And, uh, Prime admits it's likely they'll have to kill him because there might not be any other way to contain the threat. So, I mean... That's fun. Anyway, good roleplay. Both Prometheus and Samuel. Homecoming. This log follows Fencer after he departs Jules, Debrio, Samuel, you know, the people trying to prevent the virus from spreading's company because, let's face it, Fencer is super susceptible to said virus. Unfortunately. Fucking mimic virus. Anyway, so he goes to New Hope and he's apparently made contact with someone so he can get some gear. I like all the callbacks in this log. Like, for somebody who's aware of the roleplay universe at large, it's got a lot of nods to, like, the last age. It goes to New Hope and Slammers. It's... As Rizion mentioned and was obvious in the listing. You even threw a nod towards the old RPers of the last age. That was fantastic. Great nerdgasm. Anyway, basically, Venser is getting equipped, and he finds, finds out a very important piece of information towards the end, which is the Empire is finally choosing a new Empress. Which is fantastic, because you know, since Queen Isis was nuked, it, it, the Empire has basically been struggling as factions war against each other for dominance while continuing to play diplomacy with the Earth Sphere. But now they're choosing an Empress, and that'll... I imagine there's good stories to come there. Anyway, Venser gets his armor... Ugh! That scene in Slammers when he's walking in and he's recounting the various... Fantastic with the nostalgia! I, I love it! I'm just, ugh. There were so many fucking tales that originated within Slammer's Bar. And, and, uh, towards the last, or in the last stage, at the beginning, it was kind of a breeding ground. It, he mentions it in the log. It was the fucking origin, originating point of the real metahuman revolution. Or uprising, whatever. I can't remember how he wrote it. From the last age. Such a good log. Anyway, there was good interaction with the cabbie of... I loved that you took a nap in the cab while the cab was fucking... The cabbie was speaking and everything just iced over. That was hilarious. You also explained how language came to... Or written language came to the changeling people when they sleep. They just see symbols in their eyes and... Through that, that's, that's the word he gets through his iced over eyes. The ice crystals. Homecoming. It's fantastic. I love it. 
Anyway, fantastic job, Benzer. I hope you actually stick around for a while. If you do, we're going to need to see about getting Riz and all the former role-playing admin and major role-players of importance of the last age together and just go on a nostalgic role-player review, assuming I can get everybody to do videos. Again, good job, mate. Dren's Intro to Earth. So this log introduces a new character, Dren, and from his first post, I, given his focus on beauty, I'm like, huh, I wonder if this is a Hidian. Because, you know, I'm not actually on the mud while I'm reading all of these, so I have no clue what he is. I just, from the beauty aspect, I'm like, I bet it's a Hidian. And it was! <laughs> anyway, so he arrives on Earth in a series, and he's like, eh, this place is kind of a shithole. But, you know, he cheers up a little girl, makes a flower... It's a good thing he'll be tier 1 within the next few logs because I'm going to be giving him shitloads of red. Like, I'm probably going to go check to see how many reds he was given for this log and not enough for my opinion. I'm going to add more because I want to power gain people so they're not lobies because we have tier 5s. Anyway, Dren shows up, he explores, he starts forming an opinion about this world. I'm pretty sure Devrios is playing Pokemon Go. Fucking bastard. Of course, this is Dragon Ball Infinity, so nice, calm roleplay isn't what we do here, apparently. Ever! Not even breaking in the new character! Come on, Kuro! You couldn't give him one! You've never seen him in roleplay before! You couldn't give him one fucking roleplay to get his bearings first! Ah. Oh. Anyway, the problem is, it's called Intro to Earth, and the time period he has his Intro to Earth is... While well, the Colaxis Plague is still on Earth. So, Debrios actually makes a comment at one point when Dren's trying to figure out what's going on. And he's like, oh, it's just the zombie apocalypse. It's like, well, this year. And what sucks is he's not wrong because I technically Max didn't create zombies, or Chaos Max didn't create zombies per se. But, I mean, he basically took them over and controlled them completely, so I, the same difference. Well, no, that one, they ended up much more powerful than when they originally started. Anyway, since Devrios wasn't a complete noob in the certain virus aspect, he actually knew what was going on, and he recognized it because he's been in the plot with Jules and, uh... Venser... Thousand, you know, that plot, so he knows what's going on when the zombie shows up, for lack of a better word. Anyway, he deals with it with a revolver. First one's a magical shot, and then after that, regular bullets seem to work pretty well. These are just normal infects. Luckily, they didn't start eating each other, mostly because Debrios was smart enough to put them down first, because he knows what happens if you leave them alive too long. They eat each other. They get more powerful. That's not cool, dude. Not cool. Anyway, oh, God, the noob got boned in this scenario. Because he's a Hidian, which that entire species is obsessed with beauty. And he gets grabbed by an infected child. He's already been warned what they do and that there's a virus going around. So he deals with the infected child by eliminating it. That's going to cause guilt. Even at the end, he's like, how am I ever going to see myself as beautiful after I did something so atrocious? Oh, poor new guy. I had time to get into roleplay on Earth. Anyway, Devrios summons a golem to help fight off the zombies. You know, because his golems are extremely powerful compared to himself. And they deal with the threat, even... When the authorities properly show up, he gives a flag. Hey, this is a virus. You might want to get proper hazmat gear and the CDC and whatnot. And then, of course, he has magic. So he's like, but I'm not getting arrested. So douches. He, he doesn't actually say deuces or anything. But, you know, he he does vanish from the scene. Dren, ugh, poor character. New guy introduced to that as a Hidian on Earth. That's a horrible way to introduce a Hidian. Not not that it's Dren's fault, mind you. It's just, from a character development, he came looking for beauty, and he found a hideous virus that mutates people into bloodthirsty monsters. So, I mean, it, uh. 
Anyway, welcome to Dragon Ball Infinity, Dren. And uh, sorry, your intro wasn't wasn't so great. <laughs> the Colexus Plague inoculation. This log follows the attempts to rid Gilder of the virus that was infecting him. Jules is in discourse with proper officials while Thousand is checking up on Gilder. They discuss things. Jules goes back inside. Well, Thousand tells Gilder he should probably be trying to rest considering his body was pretty much torn apart when the virus was expelled because of the method Jules was using it wasn't so much a cure as just forcing all the physical particulates of the virus out left a little bit of physical damage didn't go great for gilder anyway so thousands talking to gilder telling him he should rest up gilder's playing off that he doesn't remember anything about you know when he tried to kill stuff and all the evil things that Gilder might have done while he was virus infected. He's like, I'm a good guy. No, not exactly. Anyway, so Jules, Thousand, and Gilder are all conversing on the ship. Jules is trying to find information about the person who produced the virus, which he found to be a lab technician. Anyway, he and Thousand leave the ship, leaving Gilder back to recover as they go and investigate. They get to the investigation point and... Apparently, Jules forgot his abilities for a moment before he... He's like, Thousand, why don't you go and scout the area from high orbits and jab the... And then he's like, wait, I have psionic projection. Hold on a minute. Finds out there's a psychic barrier of some sort. Ugh. Unfortunately, we were never able to carry that investigation to a fruitful conclusion. Jules and Thousand go into what they discover to be a derelict lab, still having all the lab equipment. Yes, it's old, 20 years plus old, and kind of desolate and decayed, but Jules is like, you know what? My father made laboratories out of less. I'm gonna go ahead and commandeer this equipment. So he does. He gathers it up, and then has it transported away. Meanwhile, Prime reports... Turns out the virus on the ship was an what what Jules had put into quarantine in a box in the cargo bay escaped because that shit's sentient. Made its way into the corpse of Sarah, which then proceeded to try to reinfect Gilder. Being called back by Prime, Jules and Thousand split up. Thousand goes back to check on Gilder. Jules. Decide, you know what? There's a psionic presence here. I don't know what it is. It might be related to the virus. It might not. I don't know. He could have kept investigating, but he decided, you know what? This is a virus. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to purify the place. And he proceeds to do that. Meanwhile, well, he pinged Elflane before they went into the psionic resistant area. You know, have some psionic backup just in case. Turned out not to be necessary. So Elflane goes back to the ship with Thousand, and then he proceeds to purify everything. Thousand goes back to deal with Gilder, and discovers that Gilder has been infected again. How did this happen? Well, while they were off the ship, Sarah was infected and managed to... The virus within Sarah managed to convince Gilder that, Hey, I'm a good guy! I'm a good guy! Just let me into your head! And Gilder agrees. So he lets himself be reinfected by the virus. God damn it, Gilder. Anyway, lets himself be reinfected, and Thousand gets back, but by then the sentient virus is playing coy, you know, hiding. Gilder tries to play along and tries to hide it, not knowing that Thousand literally has sensors designed to detect any sort of abnormal, like pathogenic viruses. So Thousand knows, but he lets the virus play it because Gilder's still, he's going to stay on the ship. So, I mean, the virus is quarantined. After Jules is done with the purification, he heads back to the ship to discuss things with Thousand. Thousand and Jules. Jules comes up with the conclusion after, you know, Thousand presents the metabolic restorative 
aid system that he invented, you know, basically sensor beans, huh, has been completely covered by the virus and he has a working hypothesis that, oh crap, was it made sentient by the magic in the beans? Because Jules is a scientist. He, he doesn't know how the magic part works. He just knows that he was able to create something with basic regenerative properties by exposing it to a bunch of latent magic in the sanctuary. Anyway, that's just one working theory. They have a conversation and decide they should probably train up on what Sergeant Major Slaughter taught them, which is probably a good thing given the circumstances. Not that they know it yet. And then they quarantine the ship. And Thousand finds out that his ship can do something he didn't know it could do. It has biological organic hull armor that Julie and Salnor initially developed and then Jules perfected. Anyway, so they quarantine the ship, and basically it ends with, well, when he wakes up, I'll be there when you talk to him, and Thousand plans on talking to him. You know, because Thousand is far more compassionate with viruses than Jules is. Thousand's like, hey, yeah, we can talk to it, but there's a really good probability, regardless of sentience, I'ma kill it. Not because Jules has no sympathy for sentient life, just because he knows for that specific species, if it's based off a virus to reproduce, it's going to have to take over host. Thousand, being the compassionate soul he is, advocates for the virus's ability to be a sentient being. Probably a mistake. But, you know, good guys are good guys and whatnot. And so unfortunately, in this case, Jules isn't going to be a good guy. He's going to pretty much want to kill the virus. That's that, that's kind of what he was designed for. Whether that virus be Tuffle or anything organic, he's designed to wipe it out. Anyway, good roleplay. Infection. Crash and burn. This log sees Requius basically jump onto Earth through the blockade in the atmosphere and crashing down over a mountain range. Whoops. Anyway, Davrios is in the area traveling to go meet back up with Thousand and at all. And he runs into the crash ship and finds the only survivor who then proceeds to try to eat part of the ship. Not literally, om nom nom, just touches it and starts absorbing it. Biomass and whatnot. Anyway, Debrios and Requius talk for a moment. While Thousand's coming out of his ship for a smoke. Not that I can blame him. Smoking is fantastic for androids? I still don't understand that. The android chain smokes almost as much as I do in real life. Anyway. Since thousands left the ship and the biological hull armor, which is designed to suppress energy from the inside, he could finally sense and see again on all of his scanners that aren't being held back by the hull. Anyway, he goes off to investigate while Devrios is trying to provide medical aid for Requius, and De Devrios isn't a doctor, so he's like, eh, I, I, I can't do much. I, I know basic first aid on humans. Not really human, so I'm gonna go find a doctor who actually knows how to deal with people of other species. Anyway, thousands, Devrios and Haggis meet up and discuss things. Turns out, Requius is dealing with the fact that not only is her sister dead, but her father's also dead. So that's fun, in a kind of sucky sort of way. Anyway, they try to get a hold of Jules, who's literally back at the ship, working on getting his lab together. Well, he's not working on it. He just had the gremlins do it, because they stow away on every... At least one or two stows away on every ship Dumbaston produces. And they're useful little buggers. Anyway, after Jules' brief cameo, basically back on the ship... Devrios, Thousands, and Requius head back to the ship because Requius has information that needs to be shared, but they're still trying to deal with the virus and stuff. Devrios is worried that he might be contaminated with the virus, which would suck, but Thousand, thousand alleviates his guilt, or concern, rather, by informing him that 
No, nah, dude, you just got a mild infection going on. You're you're not suffering from the same virus. You're fine. Anyway, they head on back to the ship shortly after. Earth, the Colaxis Plague. Quarantine! Or quarantine, if you don't want the board. In this log, Gilder's awake again with the virus in his head, and Thousand is in the process of having a conversation with him. Thousand's trying to reach out and say, Hey, your virus has sentience. We want to give it a body. And Gelder acts like a complete fucking child. Literally. He throws a fit the entire time. No, it's my virus! Let me go! Let me go! But he's got a contagious virus, so Thousand's like, Ha ha! No. You're not leaving the ship with the virus. We might be able to form something that can keep the virus alive since it's sentient, but it's killed thousands already. You're not leaving the ship with it. And Gelder's like, Oh, yes I am! And you're gonna have to kill me! And really, in this situation, Jules is on board the ship, as well as Thousand. It's not that Thousand can't take care of himself, but Jules is already of the position that they should just wipe out the virus entirely, and Gilder keeps making the case for that. Like his behavior in general. They don't know if it's the virus controlling Gilder, or if it's just Gilder being Gilder. They have no way of knowing. They know he's infected with it. They know it's, like, reclusive within him. But they have no idea if they're talking of in the virus or Gilder or some sort of hybrid. So that doesn't go well for Gilder. He and Thousand exchange threats and conversation, and Thousand's really trying to help the guy out. He's like, no, really. And it's, we can try to help out the virus, but you're not leaving the ship with it because it's already killed thousands. And Gilder's like, well, fuck you. I'm leaving. A thousand at one point says, well, you're not leaving this room. And Gilda proves him wrong by going to the deck below. It doesn't end well for Gilder because although Thousand was the one approaching Gilder, Jules is on the ship and he's paying attention to it, watching and monitoring. And as soon as Gilda decides he's going to try to break out, he gets bum-rushed and completely decimated by the guy who's two tiers higher than him, and massive tentacle rape. This was really a ridiculous log. I don't know if I like Gilder as a character. It seems like he isn't going to last long because he doesn't get a well flaw. He doesn't play well with others. He's a lot like Eric's in that way. The only difference is Gilder is infected with a deadly virus that could wipe out all of humanity and then spread beyond humanity and, and infect other planets. And he's like, oh no, I know best. It's my virus, my precious. Don't get me wrong. If it was Jules' choice, the virus would be dead already. But Thousand being good guy Thousand is trying to advocate for the possible sentient life. Whereas Jules is just like, hmm, we should kill it. But he respects Thousand's choice because he does have an appreciation for life himself. And he's like, yeah. Fuck it, I'll let the good guy do what the good guy does in terms of viruses and sentience. But really, Gilder, you do understand that the role playing in men, if not Kurogain, I can take control of your character at any time. Yes, the virus said, oh no, 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 I won't do that. I won't take control of you. Guess what? It lied. And I don't think Gilder gets the. So, yeah, he's not leaving the ship. He tries to, but just... Thousand was about to take Gilder down a peg, you know, just try to knock him out, but Jules wasn't having any of that shit. Gilder messed up, and Jules took his ass out. Well, technically, Gilder took his ass out himself while Jules is pummeling him because he's like, ah, fuck, I'm not winning this. Unconscious land! And then he blows something up in his face to knock him out. It was a good RP, however, as far as character to well, character insight goes, we learn that Gilder is not going to be a role player who role plays well with others. That's good. Or at least maybe not the, th this group of others. Maybe he just has a bias against Thousand because, you know, he wanted Thousand to go to an infected city with him, and then he got infected. And then bad shit happened, so he blames Thousand, apparently. Like, I don't, I don't un entirely understand Gilder's logic. But I'm guessing his education level is extremely low. 
Because he's just like, I can control it now! No, no you can't. Again, the second you leave that ship with the virus in tow, you're a carrier! And a vector. Because the role-playing had meant myself, especially. If you get off that ship, I'm gonna use you to spread the virus. So, it's fucking hilarious. You're basically spitting on the faces of the people who are trying to help you, which... Not gonna make you a lot of friends, but hey. It was a good read regardless. Gilder is kind of an annoying fucking character, though. He just evokes a kill-me-now response, and honestly... This shit keeps up. Like, if he escapes again with the virus still on him, Jules isn't gonna give him a second chance. He's gonna hunt him down and murder the shit out of him. You don't understand. Jules is a tuffle that MURDERS OTHER TUFFLES! He views tuffles as a disease. He views his own species as a disease. He was designed to take out tuffles specifically for that reason. Anyway, it was a good roleplay, though. So, I mean, it was. Like, Gilder, I dislike your character. But you roleplay him very well, which is fantastic. At least you're consistent and you stay hard-headed throughout. It, it's not a good way to interact with other player characters, especially given the situation. But, I mean, at least you're consistent, so... Earth, the Colaxis Plague. Ship on board, the ship is on board. This log enters after... Requios and Devrios have already reached Thousand Ship, and Requios has had some time to sleep. Thousand is bringing food to the room that she's in, and she's mentally going over her loss and, you know, dealing with various trauma. Thousand helps like a good guy. Like, and he himself has been dealing with emotional pain lately, which is weird because he's an android, right? A very good AI. That makes pathos very well. Anyway, so he comforts Requies, who knocks over the food tray, kicking him as she startles waking up because, you know, her dad's dead, her sister's dead. Or at least in her perspective, that's the relationship. Anyway, after she wakes up, she consumes the food, even after it was knocked over, because, really, if she can absorb food like Samuel, then... She just has to touch it. She doesn't get the same regenerative benefits that Samuel gets, but hey. Takes all kinds. Anyway. It's j Requius is just generally not having a good time. Although really, I don't think anybody's having a good time at this point, if we're being quite honest. I don't know who's, uh, who's really motivated to be happy on the planet with the virus is always and striking and destroying, trying to destroy the world. Anyway, after some conversation, the Requius isn't thrilled that Sarah's dead because she is under the illusion that she's a tough old, therefore she's immune. No, not quite. And she doesn't even have the same immunities Jules have. Jules has superior immunities because the body he's in is an artificial body. It doesn't have as many loopholes to exploit as a normal human body has, whereas Sarah Trindle was straight human tuffle. Like Julian Salnor, if he were just raw exposed to the virus, it wouldn't go well for him if he wasn't prepared. Like, he, he had to be very careful with his intentional exposure to viruses, which can be seen in the Centauri Primus arc, when he literally builds a quarantine zone in one of Julian's fingers and then blast it off when it becomes too infective for him to handle while he's internally. So yeah, that 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 virus would have pretty much killed Julian Salnor too if it had been exposed to him in the same way. Anyway, it was a good log. Requius decides, you know what? I have all the data too. She does. She has the hereditary data of the Tuffle that was bestowed upon Tieo. I miss my NPC. <sighs> but yeah, so basically, as far as science and medicine goes, she's an adequate researcher. She's not quite as good as the original, but she can certainly get the job done with enough time. Anyway, thousands start showing her the data while she continues to eat, and they get on the way. I wonder what's going to come along to fuck this up. Earth, the Galaxis Plague, out of the frying pan. 
In this log, Debrios and Thousand meet up on a ship and have a conversation about the virus. Meanwhile, Gilder wakes up, and apparently he had his hand in a, in a bucket of water. Well played, Thousand, well played. Although I think Gilder was the one who added that part. But, either way, Thousand is a character apparently hooks Gilder up to piss himself, but, you know, I don't even feel bad. Character's annoying as fuck. It's good to character, he stays in character, but still, the character's annoying. Anyway, Devrios basically agrees to help Thousand in any way he could. Wallace, Gilder began to talk mad, mad shit, because now he's chained up, and, well, at least he recognizes that if he acts up again, there is a high probability that if Jules is on the ship, he'll can kill him, because he's done with that shit. Uh, Debrios is going to go see about, you know, figuring out a way to hopefully cure multiple areas at once, since given their current technology, even with the lab, Jules lacks the resources to make a planetary cure that'll affect the rapidly mutating virus. You know, the last time he had to do such a thing, he had to get a bunch of materials via the black market on New Haven, and he doesn't have that luxury at the moment. So, after Gilder is sedated once again, because Thousand's like, no, 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 we no negotiate now, you done goofed, now you stay until the virus is gone. <laughs> and Gilder's not happy, so he just gets himself sedated. And then, as Devrios and Thousand are conversing plans on trying to fight the in spreading virus and the guy who's spreading it, Requius wakes up and is still not in great shape. Anyway, the log ends with an alarm! Oh no. Oh no. Earth, the Galaxis Plague, and into the fire! Well, that's an aptly named title, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Krakenheit, or whatever his name is, has unleashed the virus on a, yet another city, which is the alarm that was ringing in the previous post. Uh, Jules, as soon as the detection goes off, he's gone to go greet it. Samuel's coming into the Earth's atmosphere, which is good. Could use the backup. And then Thousand and Requius join Jules. They're slower than he is, but, you know, they fly after him. Samuel gets shut down, because the planet's under a quarantine. He didn't stop or anything, so the Earth Defense Force is... Oh no! There's a ship trying to rush into the quarantine zone. So, that's a no-go. They shoot him down. Samuel crashes, is a little bit butthurt, because why did no one notice me? Like, I got here to the planet, and then I said... All their power levels just... Poof. Anyway, so he follows after him. Uh, Jules immediately sets about making a quarantine zone that's not the entire city. He basically uses his optical blast connected to with his ability to evolve certain areas or modify biological systems in himself to make eyes on each of his tentacles. And then he creates a massive trench in like a two mile radius around, or a two mile diameter around the initial outbreak zone. You know, give holes for the infected to fall on, they can't jump over. Uh, the plan goes well, but Crackheit recruits his, or calls up his artificial son to go and attack the Annoyance. Luckily, Thousand shows up, Trox drops Requius off and then goes to absorb the energy from the guy who's going after Jules, leaving Jules time to finish his task. Fantastic. Teamwork. Anyway, Samuel's rushing on his way and Jules senses him, so he's like, Welcome back! By the way, you might want to go get Requius. I'm not sure if she's immune to this crap. Pretty sure she's not. So Samuel goes to aid Requius, who herself is in the process of saving as many uninfected civilians as possible. And Jules basically gives the Earth Defense Forces a heads up. Hey, I'm probably about to kill a bunch of civilians while I'm carving this trench and stuff. You punish me later. Also, get an actual quarantine field around the area. To which the Earth Defense Forces respond by 
erecting the same kind of shielding that was on Xeon 5. As I was saying, they construct the same field they use to barrier in and blockade Xeon 7. So basically, a quarantine zone was very quickly established. Anyway, the capture of Krangheit goes pretty well because Sam shows up, helps Requius, and Jules really is just assessing the situation. He gets thousands to go and capture the guy who's responsible for everything, and then proceeds to use tentacles against Craig Height's child in order to bash him down, followed up by disintegration over the trenches he forged. The log ends with evac ship, an evac shuttle arriving where Requius is at to evacuate the civilians she had managed to save. Samuel Evex with her, and Thousand and Jules escort the guy responsible off to the edge of the city where Jules plans on psionically in him and stealing everything he knows mentally to learn what he needs to do to stop the virus and whatever ins and outs and intricacies he needs to find out. So that's fun information. Unfortunately, that information kind of stabs Jules in the face because the guy was being funded by Saluge, you know, the guy created by the Chaos clone of Julian Salnor, and they're using the same bank account. So Jules, not intentionally, his money was used to fund this guy, so that's going to come up, and I'm sure that's not going to cause any issues. Fun times. Anyway, Crisis successfully averted, instead of losing an entire city, the quarantine zone is much smaller, and the downtown area itself just has to be wiped out instead of the entire city. So, success. Kind of. I guess. Good role. Earth, the Galaxis Plague, Extraction. This short solo has Thousand living up to his bargain with Gilder, telling him he'd get him out within a day. He develops the, well, a tissue sample that the virus should be able to sustain itself on, and then proceeds to extracting the virus from Gilder using decently invasive procedures. Gilder limps through it, he's fine. And then after Thousand has completely rid Gilder of any sense of the virus, he goes and dumps that bitch off in the ghetto. And then calls an ambulance and says this dude's overdosed, because... With his, as drugged up as thousands as kept him, he probably did. Anyway, good solo. At last, the truth. This solo sees Tessa and Doug and two NPCs related to Rizion's character meeting up briefly. Well, not briefly, but Tessa summons Dogen to show up because she's recently found Rizion. And she's drunk. Wine. Anyway, she has a revelation to make to go Dogen, who killed his brother a long time ago and thought Rizion was his nephew. Which is not true. Apparently Dogen and Tessa are both Rizion's parents. Anyway, Dogen's a bit irked initially, but you know, he still comforts Tessa. And to s end it, Rizion wakes up from the potion and do slumber he's in, which results in both parents thinking kill me because they realize how shitty parents they've been. Well, shitty parents would involve they've done any parenting, and that was likely not the case for early childhood development. Anyway, Rizion's quick to forgive because really, this Rizion's lived through literal hell. So he's like, yay, I have parents and they're alive. Because, you know, he always thought about that shit when he was growing up. Why am I alone? Why don't I have parents? And then he finds out he has parents after coming back from the future. Yippee! Good luck. It was really well written. Sorry, I'm not more enthused. Very tired. Welcome to Earth. This log sees Venser trying to restore the bar slammers to its former glowy glory by performing repairs 
and Rizion having departed Kanats after a happy reunion with who he learns to be his parents, arrives on Earth in a ship. I'm just going to ignore the fact that the entire planet's under quarantine right now because of the virus that's going around, but whatever. Anyway, Rizion shows up. He doesn't want to land at a spaceport, so he's like, Hey, that spot looks good, and that spot just happens to be Venser's bar's roof. Spencer doesn't take kindly to the sudden assault ship, given the warning from the last log he was in about people trying to come and kill him, you know, because that, that the Empire of Changelings don't like Fencer very much. No, not at all. So Fencer takes out the ship with a spike of ice through it, then darts off and starts putting off a bunch of fog to go get dressed in his uh, new armor. Uh, Rizion manages to bring the ship to a crash landing, which, like he says, I always crash on Earth, and you're right, you should have crashed anyway, but you should have been shot out of the sky a lot sooner than landing distance. But that's beside the point. Rizion disembarks his ship while Venser's heading out to battle. They stand off for a moment, throwing, like, shade at each other, and then Rizion having recently had experiences with Dogen and Tez, who both know Venser and, you know, shared their life stories with him and all that. Rizion recognizes the, uh, changeling. And then Venser's like, hey, are you Dogen? And he's like, no, Rizion? Oh, nifty. Anyway, uh, it ends with, uh, the two coming to peaceful terms and not murdering each other, so that's always awesome. And then they go and get drunk, because Rizion's like, Hey, you just dumped my ship, how about you give me booze, and then we can talk about how much money you owe me. Good roleplay. Holy balls, that was a long review. Have a good one. I'm going to bed.